Hi, folks. And I'm Mike O'Connor. Michael sounds like you're mad at me, and I didn't do anything yet. So, um, two, two quick things. Do I need this microphone, or can you understand me clearly the way I am? Microphone? Okay. Is this on? It's on. Okay, good. Okay. I'm just not used to being, I feel like a Las Vegas lounge lizard here. You know, I just. Anyway. Quiet, you. Second thing is, just a show of hands, how many of you are here for the presentation and how many of are you are here because we advertise free beer and pretzels? <laughs> now, which, okay, uh, bad news about the beer went in Ben's office and we've never seen it again. Somebody sat on the pretzels and they're gone, so <laughs> never mind. Okay. Uh, I'm Mike O'Connor. Some of you may remember me. I worked at the Public Library, Marathon County Public Library, for 40 years. Um, and I'm here today because for most of my life, I've been fascinated by fighter pilots, the subject of fighter pilots. Most specifically, those fighter pilots that shot, that are officially credited with shooting down five enemy aircraft and becoming aces fighter aces. Now, in the 20th century, America fielded something like 50,000 fighter pilots that saw combat in World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, whatever. Of that total, 1,447 pilots became aces out of 50,000. So we're talking about an elite here. And at the very top of that pyramid of talent, is Richard Ira Baum. Now, years and years ago when I was a little kid and getting into fighter aces, I was delighted when I found out that the top fighter ace of all time for America, you know, the top gun, was a guy from Wisconsin. I thought, how cool is that? How cool is that? And that got me interested and I got to know more about this guy because He's been dead since before the war ended. There's very little out there on him. And it just fascinated me that here's the Top Gun and there's very little information on him. And there should be, which eventually, I didn't realize at the time, led to decades and decades of writing to the National Archives, to visiting the Air Force Archives in Maxwell Air Force Base, to uh, joining the 49th Fighter Group Association, getting to know the guys that flew with him, getting to know the Bong family, talking with them, a whole bunch of things that eventually, eventually led to this book, Ace of Aces, The Dick Bong Story. And if I may say, this has to be the most brilliant book on the subject that I've ever seen. <laughs> Why it didn't win the Pulitzer, I don't know. Anyway, Dick Bo uh, if, 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 if you are familiar with the concept of a fighter ace, you get this Hollywood picture of a two-fisted man of action, cigar smoking, skirt chasing, type A behavior, can take on anybody and anything, loves to talk about themselves because they just happen to be the best fighter pilot in the world. And when I started researching Dick Bong, I got an entirely different picture and I'd like to share that picture of this atypical fighter ace today. Dick Pong was not your typical fighter ace, but he was a fascinating individual with a, a, a very interesting life. <clears throat> um, Dick Pong was born in September 1920 in a tiny Wisconsin village named Poplar, which is way up uh, northwest Wisconsin, right outside Superior. He was the, the eldest, he was the eldest uh, child in a, a family that had nine kids. They owned a farm up there. Uh, his dad was also into road construction and logging. So a lot of the times dad was gone from the farm. Being the oldest in the family, Dick kind of became an unofficial uh, foreman so that I mean, everybody had, it was a farm family. Everybody had their jobs. They had to do their jobs to make the enterprise work. But Dick was kind of an unofficial foreman. So, you know, feed the cows, milk the cows, slop the hogs, 
take the farm oil tractor out to the back 40 and plow some uh, corn, whatever. He was there, he was doing that. So he had responsibility put on his shoulders at a fairly early age. But he was part of the Bong family team. Everybody pulled together. He learned the value of teamwork very, very early. Um, in many ways, he had a typical Wisconsin farm boy upbringing. He, he, he loved sports, basketball, football, baseball, marbles. I mean, he was very competitive as a young, uh, a young person. He loved to compete, not necessarily to win, but just compete. Uh, he w uh, was a, a, a good student. He finished in the top 5% of his class. He sang in, in the Lutheran Church Choir. He played clarinet in the church band. He uh, was in plays. And he grew up to be a nice, quiet, pleasant, respectful young man. Uh, the minister at the Lutheran Church once said, you know, I never heard Dick raise his voice ever except when he shouted out the answers at his confirmation ceremony. Otherwise, he was not uh, boisterous. He was quiet, polite, and respectful. But one of the things that set him apart from a lot of people back then was his love of aviation, flying. Back in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s, everything was exploding. Everything was, was new and, 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 and earth-shaking. And, and in aviation, I mean, there were air races, zeppelins, barnstormers, Amelia Earhart, Char uh, Charles Lindbergh flying the Atlantic. Aviation was, was new and interesting, especially to a, a, a teenage boy in, in Poplar. His sisters used to relate how when an uh, airplane occasionally flew over the Bong farm, he'd stop and stare as the airplane flew by. And he kept saying, I want a career in, avi I want a career in flying. I want to be a pilot someday. Um, in 1928, Pres President Coolidge or Harding, one of those, had a, had a summer White House nearby the Bong family. And so Dick saw these air, the presidential mail plane flying over time and again, and he, that he developed that interest in flying. Plus, he built balsa models. He read all the magazines on flying that came out, you know, G8 and the battle aces, all those kind of things. He really got into, into flying. Um, after he got out of high school in 1938, he enlisted in, uh, enlisted, he, he joined, uh, he, he enrolled in the uh, Superior State Teachers College. I'm sure he had no desire to be a teacher, none whatsoever, but to get into the Army Air Corps at that time, you had to have two years of college, okay? So, in, in 1938, he enrolled in the uh, state, um, the, the college up there, and he did fine. And two years later, as uh, America was inching closer to war, and as, I mean, war had broken out in, what, 37 in China with Japan invading China, and then 39 when uh, Hitler invaded Poland and all that. I mean, the, the, the 1920s were replaced by grim times in the 1930s, and I think a lot of Americans quite rightly understood that eventually we were going to get involved in that war, so we better start preparing already. So, Dick put in his two years at the, uh, at the college, uh, and then in May 1941, he was inducted into service at, does anybody want to guess where he was inducted? Wausau, Wisconsin. So, um, he passed all the basic, all the basic ex exams and everything, went into their flight program, got through, you know, primary, basic, advanced, did very well, depending on who you talk to, Either there was a glimmer of greatness there already that, he, you know, they said, boy, he was really good in the air. He was really great in the air. And others that I've talked to said, no, he was just one of the herd. I didn't see anything that would tell me later on that he was going to be the ace of aces. Well, anyway, he got through all the, all the, all the stages of the training. And in January 1942, by then the, the, the America was at war, obviously. In January of 42, he uh, graduated from Luke Field. But instead of being sent to a 
operational squadron uh, which, were, uh, which were training now to deploy overseas, either to the Pacific or to the European Theater of Operations. Instead of being sent to one of those, those squadrons, he was kept at Luke Field as an instructor. So there must have been something there as he was going through the training that the people saw, this guy we should keep for a while because we're short of instructors. We're really gearing up to turn out as many combat pilots as we can because we're fighting a two ocean war. You know, I mean, first we have to defeat Hitler and then we have to go and defeat Japan, but we need a lot of pilots. This kid must have been good in training. We're going to keep him for a while to be an instructor. He hated that. He hated being an instructor because he wanted to get in a combat squadron and get into combat. But when you're in the military, what you want and what they tell you to do are two different things. So Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant Bong became an instructor for about six months at Luke Field. And he later on he said, you know, that was the very best thing that ever happened to me. Because the way to become a better pilot is to try and teach someone else how to fly. That you, you, you realize your own weaknesses or inadequacies and so in the end, he really liked that. Um, so anyway, he was an instructor flying AT-6 Texans, b b boring holes in the sky over Texas and everything. And then in May of 42, he finally got what he wanted, which was an assignment to an operational squadron that we're about to deploy for combat. Excuse me a second. In May of 42, in May of 42, he was assigned to the 14th Fighter Group, which is out on, uh, based in San Francisco on the West Coast. It was part of the 4th Air Force, which was responsible for the defense of the West Coast. Back at that time, you know, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, there were all these kinds of rumors. The Japanese are going to invade the West Coast. They're going to send battleships and bombard the coast. So the 4th Air Force was charged with the defense of the West Coast. It was commanded by a man that would play a great uh, role in the subsequent career of Dick Bong. His name was George Kenny, Command, uh, General George Kenny. Kenny was a, uh, like Dick Bong, he was a fighter pilot. He had been a fighter pilot in World War I. In the post-war uh, Air Force, he had steadily gone up through the ranks. He was known as a bright, innovative, can-do kind of commander, somebody you wanted on your team, a good team player, and he was very concerned with the welfare of the men under him. So, General George Kenny. Uh, as part of their workups, the 14th Fighter Group, you know, regularly were flying formation missions, navigation missions, cross countries, or just go up and do some dogfighting, polish your skills, polish the diamond, and come back. Those kind of things. No big deal. So, uh, in, on June 11th, 1942, Dick led off a flight of four P-38s on just a normal formation flight, go out and have fun. Well, I don't know that they said had fun, but just go out to practice your formation flying. Okay, but about half an hour after those four P-38, pre-P-38s left, the phone started ringing at the 4th Air Force Command headquarters. Some idiot just buzzed the Golden Gate. Okay, thank you, folks. Uh, a little later, some more calls. Somebody just flew down Market Street waving at the secretaries in a P-38. Okay, uh, a little later. Somebody just looped the loop around the Golden Gate. Um, should we notify the general about this? Yes, I think we should. Uh, then a little later, somebody buzzed my house in San Anselmo. They blew the laundry off the line and my laundry is in the dirt and I'm really mad. Well, I th thank you for your input, ma'am. We'll, we'll get back to you. So, Dick's four P-38s come back to, the, to March Field and they land and there's a bird colonel and a major standing on the flight line. And he gets out of the aircraft and they say, uh, Lieutenant Bong, you are grounded effective immediately. You are confined to quarters pending uh, inspector general investigation into a par par possible court martial. So we're not talking fun and games here. We're talking serious business. So he gets confined to quarters and then to the next day, 
his mother and one of his sisters was planning on coming out to visit him. Well, they showed up the next day and said, could we see Lieutenant Bong here for a visit? No, you can't. He's confined to quarters, he's grounded. And eventually his mother, Dora, talked to the base commander and he said, you can have 15 minutes and then that's it because he's grounded, this is serious business. So Dick sat in his quarters for a couple weeks while the inspector general investigated this whole flight and all the, all the reports and everything. Now, there's a, there's a rest of the story here because before this, other Army Air Corps pilots and a few Navy pilots had done similar things, and in some cases, very serious violations of flight procedures. But Dick's flight kind of was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So a couple weeks later, two weeks later, he found himself in the office of General Kenny, who is on one of these pictures here. Um, and it, not, it, did, it, it did not go well. Uh, Kenny was uh, about 5'4", uh, had kind of a bulldog expression, close chop, uh, a flat top, uh, 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 kind of a weathered face because he had flown in open cockpit aircraft. And so uh, he did not invite Dick to sit down. You know, you're braced. You stand there, and for the next, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, he, he, he went on, he talked about safe flying procedures and the damage that flight had done to the image of the 4th Air Force, and Dick's abysmal leadership during that flight, and the damage it had done to the image of the 4th Air Force, and the possible damage to, and her, to civilians. And did we mention the damage to the image of the 4th Air Force? And Dick, you know, the media always put always portrayed Dick as a stoic Swede, you know, ice in his veins. But I cannot believe that as he was standing there at attention, he wasn't thinking, oh my God, they're gonna take my wings, they're gonna bust me, and I'm gonna end the war peeling potatoes in Alaska. <laughs> and so uh, Kenny went on, and eventually he stopped. And then it was kind of like, okay, here it comes, here it comes. And then he leaned forward, he was, at, he was sitting at the desk, and the report on the flight was right in front of him. And he said, uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Bong, how does the P-38 handle it at lower altitudes? And it was, have you ever had uh, these kind of moments where you're expecting somebody to say or do something and they do something completely different and it's kind of like, what? Well, at that moment, Dick realized that he wasn't going to get court-martialed. Kenny was interested in how the P-38 handled at lower altitude. He wanted to know how his pilots were flying. And according to Kenny, he then took the report and tore it up and threw it away. So, uh, but that's not all that happened. Uh, he, he, he said to, to Bong, you go back to your squad and you, you write a 5,000 word essay on safe flying procedures and you talk, you, you give that to your squadron. Then you go out to San Anselmo because you were the Dilbert that buzzed the lady's house that blew the, fur, the, 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 the clothing onto the ground. You go out there, you help her with the laundry and anything else she wants you to do. Okay, but there was something more there too. Right after he got back to quarters, he was transferred out of the 14th fighter group. So he, and they shortly afterwards deployed for combat in the Mediterranean, and he didn't go with them. I mean, he was confined to quarters, and eventually they had him flying different desk jobs for a couple weeks, pondering what to do. Um, and he was wondering about what they were gonna do with him, too. As it turns out, shortly after Kenny had his uh, kinder, gentler talk with Dick about safe flying procedures, he got a call from Henry Arnold, General Hap Arnold, who was commander of the Army Air Force. And uh, General MacArthur, who was the supreme commander over in the Pacific, wasn't very happy with the Air Force in general. He thought that the Air Force units under his command in the South Pacific were doing a lousy job. They were a bunch of uh, you know, ne'er-do-wells that didn't do anything. And the current Air Force commander over there didn't kiss his butt enough, basically. Douglas MacArthur was, had an ego 10 times bigger than his talent. So if you didn't think he walked on water, you weren't gonna be around Douglas MacArthur very much. So MacArthur wanted a new Air Force commander. Called uh, Hap Arnold and said, I want somebody that I can work with, can do, good man, innovative, whatever. Arnold said, 
Okay, I got just the man for you. He called Kenny and said, I want you to go over and, and, and run what was eventually became the fifth Air Force under Douglas MacArthur. Uh, so that's what you're gonna be doing. And before the conversation ended, Kenny said, well, can I take along 50 P-38 Lightnings because Kenny really believed in the aircraft and thought that was the aircraft that would help win the air war in the Pacific. Can I take 50 P-38s and 50 P-38 pilots with me? And Arnold said, sure, go ahead, fine. Well, at the top of that list of 50 pilots, guess whose name was there? Because even though Dick had pulled a boneheaded uh, event with his flight, he was a good pilot, and Kenny knew he would need new pi great pilots to help beat the Japanese. So, September 42, Dick finds himself on a B-24, a four-engine B-24 Liberator flying out to the, the Pacific. Um, there were about a dozen other fighter pilots on that plane with him, one of whom was a guy named Jay Robbins, who later became a fifth Air Force ace with like 22 kills. And later on, years later on, uh, somebody said, well, when you were flying out there, did, did you see that, that how, how good Dick was going to be? And he said, from what I knew of him, if you had lined up those 12 people and said, one of these guys is going to be the ace of aces, Dick Bong would have been the last guy I would have picked. Because in person, Dick was quiet and shy, not very talkative, friendly, but he didn't make a lot of close friends. He wasn't your typical fighter pilot. Okay, so they get over to the Pacific to the 5th Air Force. At that time, the 5th Air Force was understaffed and had a lacked aircraft, and that continued for a while. So they only had enough P-38 Lightnings to equip one squadron, and Dick was temporarily transferred to a squadron uh, under the command of a guy named Tom Lynch. Tom Lynch eventually became one of Dick's closest friends over there, and he flew combat with them. Dick's first combat mission was December 27th, 1942. On that mission, he scored two, two he, was, he was credited with two confirmed kills. Now, let me tell you, for a new, a new pilot, new to combat, to score two kills on his first mission is very, very rare. So, he got two kills, and he was on his way. He flew with the squadron for a couple months, eventually shot down five enemy aircraft, became an ace, and was transferred to, to the squadron that he was supposed to fly with originally, the 9th Fighter Squadron, uh, 49th Fighter Group, the Flying Knights, and he joined them in uh, uh, New Guinea. And I would think that his squadron probably had a, a little period of adjustment when Dick showed up because if you look at pictures like in, in, in the Ace of Aces book, he looks like a skinny kid that should be shooting baskets in Poplar, not climbing into a P-38 flying combat. But yet, he was an ace already. There were very few aces in the 5th Air Force at that time. And here is this skinny, tow-haired kid with kind of a baby face, and he was an ace already. And he was quiet. He was shy. He wasn't like your typical pilot. He didn't talk about what he did much. He was nice enough, but he was quiet. So there was a period of adjustment when they realized that, okay, on the ground he's a church mouse, but he's one of ours. Band of brothers, he's one of ours. Once he straps on a P-38, that church mouse disappears, and what you get is an aggressive, masterful fighter pilot that, that, that can fly the aircraft like you wouldn't believe. The uh, Ninth Fighter Squadron was equipped with the Lockheed Lightning P-38. Oh, and I just broke my aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. The P-38 was a revolutionary fighter when it was introduced in 1941. It had, well, obviously it had two engines, Pilots, the pilots sat in a central nacelle, that little cockpit there. Right ahead of him were four 50 caliber machine guns and a 20, a 20 millimeter cannon. So that uh, ended a lot of gunnery problems because you just 
pointed your nose at an enemy aircraft, you hit the firing button on the control yoke and the bullets went straight out. Couldn't miss, couldn't miss. The P-38 was the most advanced fighter in the Army Air Corps inventory at the time. A fast climbing bomber, uh, I'm sorry, a fast climbing fighter designed to intercept bombers mostly. Uh, longer ranged than any of the other Army Air Corps or Navy planes that were flying combat at that time. Much longer range. Ideal for the Pacific, long range, two engines. If you lost one engine, you got the other one to bring you home. Insurance policies. Heavily armed. The other thing about um, the P-38 and all American fi uh, fighters and bombers is that they were well protected. There, were armor, there was armor plate for the pilot, the fuel tanks were self-sealing, so if you shot holes in the fuel tank, it sealed up the leaks and the fuel didn't leak out. By contrast, all the Japanese fighters and bombers that Dick would fight against from 42 to 45, almost all of them lacked armor plating for the pilot or air crew. That was a deliberate decision on the part of the Japanese military. Likewise, the fuel tanks weren't self-sealing, so if you shot a couple holes in a fuel tank, the fuel started spilling out and could be ignited by other machine gun rounds. The Japanese designed their aircraft, if I may just di 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 go back here a second, the Japanese designed their aircraft for long range and maneuverability. They wanted their aircraft to fly farther than any of their enemies could. But they did that by taking out the armor plating and the self-sealing uh, material so that if you hit a, a, a Japanese Betty bomber, if you hit it with a few rounds, it would flame up and go down and the seven-man crew was dead. Uh, the Japanese Zero fighter was the most maneuverable aircraft in the world at that time. It could fly square turns. I mean, it was, it was a wonderful aircraft, longer range than any other fighter in the world, but if you hit it with a couple rounds, it would flare up, blow up, and the pilot was lost. Japanese air crews typically in that period never carried parachutes because in the samurai tradition, you fought until you were died. To be captured by the enemy was just anathema. You didn't allow that. So when you shot down a uh, Japanese Zero, the pilot was dead. The trouble was he was a very experienced pilot at that time, and you just lost all that experience. His replacement would come in, brand new guy from training command. So the American planes, they could, you could shoot pieces out of them, you could shoot cylinders out of their engines, and they'd bring you back. Uh, if you had to bail out, the Americans had air-sea rescue units to come get you. The Japanese didn't believe that at all. So their aircraft were vulnerable. They thought that in the great samurai tradition, you didn't, you know, if, if you went down, you, you weren't saved, you were dead. But that was a hell of a way to fight a war, because you're gonna lose all your experienced people eventually, and the replacements are, are so green it's pathetic. In the meantime, America is cranking out thousands and thousands of aircraft that will survive air combat, thousands and thousands of pilots that will you know, replenish their ranks. So it was a war of attrition that the Japanese could not win. So anyway, sorry for the history lesson, but uh, uh, Dick eventually reported to the, the Ninth Fighter Squadron and started flying combat with them. And the victory slowly started building up. Uh, and it's funny because they, uh, you know, they would ask him, well, how, how, how are you doing that? How did you get so many kills? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. I'm a lousy shot, I just got lucky. And they'd say, what do you mean you're a lousy shot? You're one of the leading aces in the Fifth Air Force. How can you be a lousy shot? Well, because I never got any gunnery training when I was going through the training command. At the time Dick went through the training command, the, mili the American military was so, so geared up to just putting bodies in the cockpit that if they, didn't, if they had to cut time, if they had to cut flight time, training time, gunnery suffered. So a lot of Amer uh, some American pilots went into combat having never fired their guns before they engaged in enemy aircraft. And Dick was one of the pilots that had very little gunnery training. So when he said, I'm a lousy shot, he wasn't b being immodest, he was being truthful that he hadn't gotten much training. But when he was a, a kid back in Poplar, he hunted all the time, you know, deer, goose, squirrel, whatever. 
and he, was, he had some of the natural gunnery training there. But anyway, his score slowly starts building. A kill here, a kill there. Um, you'll, you'll, if, if, if you read the book, you'll see how he's not your, again, your typical Hollywood fighter pilot, which there's a bunch of Japanese aircraft, I'm gonna jump in, I'm gonna shoot everyone I can down, and then we'll come back to base and have a beer. He was a very analytical pilot. If you read his combat reports, he's, he's thinking all the time, you know, there's, there's the Japanese, they're 5,000 feet below, here I am with 12 P-38s. What I'm gonna do is this, okay? This is what I'm gonna do, attack, I'm gonna attack that guy. Okay, I shot him down, great, break away. Oh, I missed him, well, okay, break away. I damaged him, well, okay, break away. He never fixated on targets. You know, if he did something, fine, but he always broke away because he realized if you get fixated on a target, somebody else might be sneaking up behind you ready to wax your butt. So he wasn't like some of the pilots that that he flew against, and I'll get into one of them later, that was kill crazy. He did what he could, break away, come back, attack again. You know, fight's so worth, okay, go home. No big deal. He wasn't a, one of these pilots that, I got five, I want 10. I, know I have 10, I want 15. He was never that concerned with the numbers uh, that he was getting, the number of kills. He was very uh, concerned with flying combat because he enjoyed that, which I, I don't know that that, that that made him a warmonger. It just, he loved the, comp he was a competitive person and fighter combat is probably the ultimate competition, okay? So anyway, his score is building up and building up and now a, a very troublesome development is happening because reporters are coming to the base and say, Lieutenant Bong, tell us about how you did, what you did. How did you score all those kills? And, and they were expecting your typical fighter pilot. Well, there I was at 5,000 feet and I banked and I looped and then I dived down and I splashed him and I pulled back up and I rolled over. And they'd come up to Dick and say, well, uh, you're, you're the top ace of the 5th Air Force right now. Yeah, I, I guess I am, yeah. Well, how does that make you feel? Okay. Well, how did, you, how did you shoot down your latest victories? Oh, I, I just got lucky. And he'd walk away, and the reporter would be going, how can I write an article? This guy gave me three sentences. But they didn't realize that that's, that's who Dick Bong was when he was growing up. You don't toot your own horn. But the 5th Air Force commanders and, and the media wanted all this uh, information from the pilots so they could write their articles. And, Throughout his, his Air Force career, it was a constant battle between the, the, the media pressing him for details and him being his usual reticent self saying, well, you know, I just got lucky. So anyway, his score, uh, and now we're talking like the summer of 43, summer of 43. And his score is slowly building. And because he's an experienced combat pilot, he's leading like two ship elements or four ship flights, and occasionally the squadron. And it's, it's, it's enlightening because sometimes when they'd be sitting around, you know, the, the uh, fighter pilots tend to be an ambitious lot, you know, type A behavior. And they'd be talking about uh, leading flights and everything. And Dick just came out and said, you know, I don't want to be a flight leader. I don't want my own squadron. I, I, I don't want to be responsible for other people's lives. But again, if you're in the military and they say, you're leading red flight today, yes, sir. I mean, he was a competent pilot, but he was really conscious about, about people losing their lives under his command. But he flew his missions because he was a good soldier. Um, by, no, by November 43, Dick's score stood at 21, 21 kills. And he's getting a lot more media attention now because, and here, here's a, another history lesson, but back in World War I, Eddie Rickenbacker was America's ace of aces, and he scored 26 kills. So he was America's ace of aces. Well, now there's some pilots in the 5th Air Force and in the 8th Air Force over in England, their scores are beginning to get 
closer to Rickenbacker's record. So there's a, the, the media and the Air Force PR officers are starting to build this, this competition, this ace race. Who will be the first one, who will be the first Army, uh, Army Air Force pilot to crack Rickenbacker's record? By this time, two Marine pilots had, had equaled the record, but they had not topped it. So they started generating all this publicity. And that meant, what else? More reporters coming around to the base saying, you know, how did you do on your last mission? And, and, and they, Dick would do the best he could. Uh, what bothered him, though, is that not only did he get publicity, in the States, the reporters started coming to his family and saying, well, you know, well, well, Dora, tell us about your, your, your son and everything. And time and again in his, in his letters home, Dick would say, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I shot down two more, and that's going to be more publicity, and they're going to be banging on your door more. I'm really, really sorry, but th that's the way it is back then. So November 43, Dick has been flying combat for um, uh, a year, and he's sent home on leave. If he thought that it was going to be a nice, pleasant, quiet family leave, he was wrong. Because here's one of America's uh, leading aces coming home. So the reporters were waiting for him when he, when he got off the, 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 the train. Um, he arrived just in time for deer hunting season, so November. Okay, um, the, the, uh, November. I think it was November 17th. Everybody's in the Bong household waiting for Dick to come because he's driving up from Chicago. So they're all sitting there, uh, and, it's, and it's, it's nighttime. Here comes some lights. Oh boy, it's, it's Dick, it's Dick. No, it's some reporters. Okay, well, come on in, have a piece of apple pie, sit down, fine. fine. Here's another set of lights. Is it Dick? No, it's more reporters. Well, come on, sit down, have, have fun. Here comes another set of lights. It's teachers from the Superior State Teachers College with ammunition, uh, did rounds for their rifles for deer hunting. Okay, another car shows up. It's the American Legion officials wanting to welcome Dick home. Okay, one more car comes. It's the Superior College ROTC band, and they want to serenade Dick when he comes. So you've got a house full of people. Dora's doing her best to make him welcome, you know, coffee, chocolate, whatever. They had a piano. It was a very musical family. Dick played clarinet in the, uh, in the band. Everybody was fun, happy. Finally, Dick shows up, and instead of seeing his family, he sees about 30 people waiting to greet him. So they all have a, a, as good a time as you can. And eventually, about two or three in the morning, Dora says, "Okay, get out." You know, I'm just gonna... no, she says it nicely because back then people were nice to each other. Um, next day, oh boy, we're going to go deer hunting. Look out the window. There's a couple of carload of reporters out there, um, so that they go out. Oh, we, we want to take pictures of Major Bong of America's ace, uh, one of his, the leading aces, getting his deer. So we're just going to take some pictures of you. You can go in the woods. Dick can get his deer. Come on back. We'll take pictures, and then, and then we'll leave. OK. So they go out deer hunting in the morning. Um, there's something wrong. As I remember, there's something wrong with Dick's rifle. The sights are off, and he misses a deer, but some of the others get some deers. A deer, plural. And they come back, and, and, and the reporters are waiting for Major Bong, or no, Captain Bong to get his deer. And so, so these simple farm folk just sit around and say, what are we going to do? And somebody comes up with a bright idea. Look, let's go back out. The first person that shoots a deer, that's Dick's deer, OK? And then we'll come back, and they'll leave. And that's just what they did. And if you see pictures of, here's Major Bong posing with his, his buck. No, it isn't. It was the first deer that somebody shot just to get the reporters out of the house. OK? So anyway, simple farm folk put one over on the city slickers. Uh, um, the, the, the one, I mean, and, and during this leave, there was a lot of PR, speeches, presentations, parades, uh, you know, local officials, all that. None of that stuff that Dick liked doing, but he did because he was a nice person. And they, people asked him to be in the Dick Bong 
prayed, so he could hardly say no. Um, but the, the one really nice thing that happened uh, on, that, on that November to February leave was that the Superior State Teachers College had their homecoming. And so somebody came up with the bright idea that, hey, Dick Bong is here, you know, our, 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 one of the leading aces is in town. Let's ask him to crown the homecoming queen. Okay, fine. So they, they, they had one of Dick's sisters, um, Nelda or Joyce, one of them, went and asked Dick if he'd do it. And <laughs> I'm sure he very reluctantly said, okay, fine. So anyway, the, the, the night of the homecoming, everybody's dancing, having a good time, but everybody's actually waiting for Dick Bong to come through the door. Okay, and here he comes. Gee, he's nice, he's cute, he's got a nice smile. Isn't he a nice person? Can I dance with you, Captain Bong? I'm sorry, I don't dance. Oh, so anyway, they go on and on as you do at a homecoming, and eventually it's time to crown the homecoming queen. So Dick takes the crown, puts it on her head, the, the last year's homecoming queen was Marge Vattendahl, who was a, a, a very attractive redhead. Uh, she could have been a model, and actually in later life she was a model, but she was the previous homecoming queen, and she was supposed to crown this year's king. So she got so flustered at being around Dick that Dick eventually took the crown and put it on the head of the homecoming king. <laughs> But he had that kind of effect on people. I mean, my gosh, here's a national celebrity and one of us, but oh, gee. So anyway, the, 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 the uh, homecoming gets over. They all leave. Uh, Marge and a friend go to a local ice cream shop in, in Superior. And they walk in the door. And who is sitting there at a table but um, Dick and two of his sisters and a, a, family, a family friend. And so Dick, you know, motions them over. Now. Ladies, let me put this question to you. One of America's newest celebrities, who also happens to be a cute guy with a nice smile, is motioning you over. What are you gonna do? Oh, no, no, I, I'm sorry, I just don't have time for you. Yes, she probably jumped over the table and sat down with him. So, they hit it off that night. Pretty soon Dick is asking her for a date. Another date, another date. By the time he leaves, or his leave gets over with in, um, February, they're a couple. They're a couple. Uh, which is, again, the nicest thing that happened on that leaf. He met Marge, and she became a very important part of his life. Um, Dick returns to the South Pacific, to the Fifth Air Force, in February. And he's expecting to be assigned uh, to his old unit, the Ninth Fighter Squadron, the Flying Knights and to fly P-38s again. Well, he finds out that because the 5th Air Force is so short of aircraft, the 9th Fighter Squadron is now flying the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, which is this big, hulking, seven-ton fighter with a, a, an enormous radial engine, uh, 850 calibers in it, it, it can't climb worth a dime, but it dives like a brick outhouse. I mean, boom! And no self-respecting P-38 pilot would be caught dead flying a P-47. So, Dick, so the 9th Fighter Squadron is out. He's not going back there. There were some other uh, squadrons in the 5th Air Force that were equipped with P-38s. So he could have gone to one of them and assigned to one of them. But instead, Kenny calls him in and says, I'm going to give you an, uh, a desk job here in the fifth in the fifth fighter command headquarters, and that's just no. You're well, he didn't say this, but no, you're not. I'm not going to fly desk for the rest of my combat career. But but then Kenny said, look it, you're going to be assistant operations officer. You keep things moving smoothly, and if a mission comes along that looks promising, you can attach yourself to that mission and fly it. Okay. Okay. That sounds like a pretty good deal. Now, but that opened up uh, a controversy that lingers to this day because people said, hey, Kenny was playing favorites. He was playing favorites. He gave Dick Bong a blank check to fly combat whenever he could. He didn't give that to anybody else, did he? And the answer to that is, well, actually he did. And that that's, tells you something about the politics of running a an Air Force. 
Um, Tom Lynch, Dick's friend, Tom Lynch had just gotten back from leave and was assigned to a, a headquarters position with the same proviso. As long as you keep things running smoothly, you can attach yourself to a mission and fly it. And now that Dick was here, and if you two want to fly special missions by yourself, that's okay as long as you keep operations running smoothly. So was he playing favorites in terms of Dick? Well, sort of, but he was also, Kenny was a smart operator. By this time, that whole thing about the ace race had been building up, and Dick's score was getting closer and closer to that 26 uh, mark. Likewise, Tom Lynch started scoring kills, and he got closer to that score too. There was another pilot named Neil Kirby who had just gotten a similar arrangement, sent into the headquarters to have command responsibilities, but if, if there was time, you could fly missions. All three of them were in the running to become the first Army Air Force pilot to break Rickenbacker's record. Now, was Kenny playing favorites? Yes, but he knew that if one of those people broke the record, it would reflect very favorably upon his command, and it might mean more personnel for Fifth Air Force, more aircraft. So he allowed that to happen. As it turns out, uh, unfortunately, Tom Lynch was killed soon afterwards in a strafing mission. Neil Kirby was killed in air combat because he violated his own rules of air combat. Neil Kirby was one of the pilots, leading pilots, that got obsessed with this ace race thing, that he was very determined to become the, the uh, ace of aces, uh, the American ace of aces, period. So in his last combat, he violated combat rules that he laid down and said, you guys got to do this, you don't do that. Well, to get another kill, he violated his own rules and got killed because he got obsessed with this ace race business. Again, Dick was never that concerned about numbers, about I, I have 15, I have 20, I have 25. What I want to do is fly combat. He never let that warp his thinking in combat. But other pilots bought into that and it cost them their lives. So, Lynch is out of the running, Kirby is out of the running, uh, and the people in the, in the Eighth Air Force in, in Europe were falling behind. On April 12th, 1944, Dick flew a mission uh, and, and shot down three enemy aircraft and broke Rickenbacker's record. He didn't just tie it, he broke it. So, America's newest ace of aces, Major Richard Ira Bong, uh, Captain Richard Ira Bong by now, he had barely been in combat for, well, let's see, February, March, four months. Kenny pulls him out of combat right away, sends him back to the States for more PR because he's America's ace of aces and to get some gunnery training. Because remember, Dick always said, I'm a lousy shot. So Kenny said, okay, you go back to the States, you get some gunnery training. When you come back here, I want you to go to all the squadrons and share the knowledge that you're gonna get with them. So he goes off to the States, lots more PR, speeches, parades, whatever. Uh, and he also asked Marge to marry him. At, 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 at some point before, they had been talking about marriage and Dick said, you know, I, I, I don't think we should get married in wartime because people can get killed. And as it happened, several of Dick's wingmen who were married had been killed. So he was very conscious about, you know, we shouldn't tie the knot quite yet. But anyway, he wanted Marge and so he asked her to marry him. And uh, when he went down to Texas to get his gunnery training, uh, he was engaged. In Texas, the training was just opened his eyes to, to what he could have been. Later on, he said, you know, if I had had that gunnery experience when I started flying in um, December 42, I would have had 75 or 100 kills. I would have. It, it, it improved my skills that much. Um, so he gets the training. He gets engaged. He comes back to the South Pacific, gets another headquarters position as uh, gunnery, Gunnery instructor, officer, something like that. And he visits the different squadrons and tells them what he's learned and everything. But he's told, you cannot fly combat. You just go to those squadrons and, and teach them what you know. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. 
I'll do that, really. Um, and then pretty soon, he comes back to Kenny and says, you know, um, how do I know how effective I am as an instructor? You know, I, I teach these guys all these things, but how do I know how effective I am as an instructor if I don't fly the missions with them? And so here again, Wisconsin farm boy, he's not so dumb. And Kenny says, okay, you can fly combat missions and see how the guys are doing, but you can only engage enemy aircraft in terms of, if, if they attack you, in terms of self-defense. You understand? Of course, of course, sir, sir. So, almost the very first mission he flew after he was allowed to fly combat again, his, he scored two kills. One of the kills was like 5,000 feet below him, flying in the opposite direction. Now, how does, how does that qualify as self-defense? But, you know, the, the fifth there, oh, okay, fine, you got two more kills, whatever. So, he wasn't, he was a smart little guy. So, he, kept, he keeps flying missions, pretty soon he has 30 kills. He, he's, he's above every other Army, Air Force, Marine, and Navy pilot. I mean, he is already the top dog. Um, then in October, um, Douglas MacArthur and a few other troops invade the Philippines. I think it was Luzon or Leyte, one of the two. I don't know if you've seen that film where he, he comes walking up the beach, you know, wading through the water, and there conveniently is a microphone right on the beach waiting to record D Douglas MacArthur saying, people of the Philippines, I have returned, rally to me. Well, what you don't know is, the, the landing craft that brought MacArthur to the beach was the type that it went right up to the beach, dropped its ramp, and so you could walk from the boat to the beach without getting your feet wet. But MacArthur, being the showman he was, he had the, the craft stop early and lower it into the water. So you see this dramatic image of him walking through the water to the Philippines. He was quite a showman, quite a showman. So anyway. MacArthur and the Army and the Army Air Force is uh, committed to the uh, Philippine invasion. They underestimated the Japanese response terribly. The Japanese, Phil, the, the Philippines was like a dagger pointing at the home islands. And so the Japanese poured lots of aircraft and lots of personnel and army to try and defeat the Americans. Um, Kenny wired back to 5th Air, Air, Air Headquarters in New Guinea. Yeah, New Guinea and said, send up 40 aircraft. Send me the best pilots you have because we desperately need air cover here. Okay, so uh, the next day, they hear the sound of P-38 Allison engines coming over. And he and MacArthur go to the airstrip to welcome the people, the, the pilots. And as they're going down the, the, the line, welcoming everybody, they see Dick Bong. They say, Bong, what are you doing here? I didn't say, I didn't tell them to send you up here. and." According to reporters, he said, well, uh, you, you said to send up the best, and I'm here, so can I fly? And, okay, fine, fine, just fly your aircraft. So he starts flying combat in, in, the, in the Philippines, and pretty soon his score is 35, 36, 37, 38. Kenny says, enough. This guy deserves the Medal of Honor because he's had 38 kills, he's been flying combat for roughly two years. MacArthur says, fine, write something up, I will award it to him immediately. So, um, December 12, 1944, at, at an airstrip called Tacloban, they have a six P P-38s lined up in, a, in a, cir a half circle. They have an honor guard of 5th Air Force pilots here. And in the background, there are hundreds of 5th Air Force and Army personnel. There's MacArthur and all the generals waiting for Dick to show up. Unfortunately, there was a minor screw up that they forgot to tell Dick that this was going to happen and when it was going to happen. So everybody's setting up ready to go and Bong isn't there. So they called over. He was at a different uh, airstrip named Dulag. And they called over and said, uh, Bong, send up Bong to Tacloban. There's a ceremony here. He has to be there. And he said, no, that, they're just pulling your leg. I'm not going up there. OK, five minutes later, a call. Get Bong up here. There's a ceremony. He's getting the Medal of Honor from MacArthur. 
So they put him in a, a Piper Cub, fly him up there, and everybody's waiting there. And so he walks up to MacArthur, and, and oh yeah, I, for, I forgot to mention, there are dozens of still photographers and movie film shooting all this. So he walks up to MacArthur, and MacArthur, as his, as his wont, had written up this flowery speech that he was going to give to uh, Bong, and luckily he threw it away. And uh, if you look at some of these pictures, he puts his arms on, on, on Bong's shoulders, and he says, Major Richard Ira Bong, who has ruled the air from New Guinea to the Philippines, I hereby induct you into the society of the bravest of the brave, the wearers of the Congressional Medal of Honor, which I think is one of the best speeches I've ever heard. And so, pins, pins on the medal, endless photographs, you know, and everything is over with. Here's the rest of the story. This had been such a rush job that Dick had not had breakfast. So he goes wandering off trying to find some of his old buddies from 49th Fighter Group because he's hungry. And a reporter tags along. And they, they come up to a, um, Jerry Johnson, who's one of his oldest friends in the 49th Fighter Group. He's in a tent. And you know the congratulations being, good job. Are you going to go home soon? Yeah, I think so. I'd like to stay for 50, but Kenny said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send you home soon. Okay, fine. Does anybody got any food? I'm really hungry. And they find a, can, a tin of tuna, and he opens it, and the reporter, the reporter is scribbling all this down. And so he, he eats the tuna, and as he's eating it, he says, you know, boy, my mom made the best tuna sandwiches. She used to put onions in it, and oh, they tasted real good, you know. And I'm thinking, 20 minutes ago, you were in front of hundreds of people getting a Medal of Honor, and now you're talking about your mom's cooking. I mean, that says so much about Dick Bong that I, I just found fascinating. You know, it's only I got a Medal of Honor. Okay. One, once upon a time, one, one of his family asked him what medals he had gotten. He said, well, I've gotten Distinguished, distinguished Service Cross, Distinguished Flying Cross, Silver Stars, blah, blah, blah. I, only, I haven't gotten the Congressional Medal of Honor or the Purple Heart. I won't ever do anything to deserve the one, and I don't want to get the other. Because nobody but a fool wanted a Purple Heart. But he got a Medal of Honor in December 44. He scores two more kills, and Kenny says, enough. You've been flying combat for two years. You've used up your luck. You're going home to get married, have little bongs, and, 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 and go test jets out in California. The Air Force is introducing a new fighter to their inventory, the P-80 Shooting Star. It's a jet aircraft, brand new technology. There's a lot of trouble with the aircraft. There's crashes, but it's a plum assignment that people want. They want to test the P-80. So Dick is scheduled to, uh, to be a P-80 test pilot. In February, for, I mean, and then he goes home to, again, en endless publicity. Um, he and Marge get married in February 45. If they thought they were going to have a quiet little wedding ceremony, boy, were they wrong. Thousands of people swarmed Poplar. There were so many people that they had to lock the church doors to do the ceremony. And they did two ceremonies, one, the real one, and a second one for the press. So they had two ceremonies. They got married fine and dandy. Had a, a wonderful honeymoon. Um, a couple months later, they move out to California. And Dick checks into the Lockheed plant and starts learning about the P-80. And he made a few flights, and then on um, uh, August 6, 1945, he's scheduled to test a, a P-80. It's just a normal flight test. Um, as he's about to, to sign up, to, to go out to the aircraft, something comes up, and I forget exactly what, but he has to go back in the office, and the other pilot that was going to test a P-80 takes his aircraft and launches off and flies away. So Dick takes this guy's P-80 and, and as his assignment. Um, gets on the runway, starts going down the runway, uh, lifts, uh, you can tell as he's going down the runway, something's wrong, it's not developing the power. There's white puffs of smoke coming behind it. It lifts off, gets up about two, 300 feet, something like that. The wings start to wobble, you know, it's starting to stall. Um, and depending on who you talk to, most of the people that I've talked to said, I saw him steer the aircraft away from apartments. 
Other people say, no, he didn't have time. So anyway, he lifts off two, three hundred feet up. The, the, the aircraft stalls, it dies. He jettisons the canopy. He jumps out because at that time they didn't have ejection seats. Jumps out. The aircraft crashes. He, he, when he bailed out, he was maybe 300 feet above the ground. Parachute didn't have time to open. He falls to the ground and is killed. So. Mar Marge finds out the news by listening to the radio. Uh, later on, Hap Arnold, <coughs> Hap Arnold calls and says, we can bury him in Arlington. It's, it's an honor he deserves. Dora, his mother, said, no, he gets buried here. So he's, um, Dick Bong dies on the same day that Hiroshima is atomic bombed. And, and, but matter of fact, on some newspapers, his death is highlighted more than the Hiroshima attack because he was a national celebrity by that time. Everybody knew him. I mean, he'd been out in Hollywood with the stars. One time he was on the Bing Crosby show, and I thought, Bing and Bong, <laughs> well, whatever. Um, and I remember, too, he was on a, a, a radio interview show. And they're here, here again. This is a, an insight into Dick Bong. And they were saying, uh, talking about his, his, his home life. And, oh, yeah, I, I sang in the Lutheran, the, the Lutheran choir. Oh, really? What kind of songs did you sing? And instead of just saying, well, you know, come be with me or something, he starts singing on national radio. And he had a wonderful voice, by the way. And I just thought, how sweet. <laughs> so. Uh, August 6th, he's killed. Um, they fly him back to Poplar. He's buried. Uh, the war ends. And then, unfortunately, he goes from being a national celebrity to like a, a forgotten hero that everybody wants to come home, you know, get married, have kids, get back to, to life as it is. And for years and years and years, his legacy is neglected. Um, and finally, I mean, there's talk of a, a bong museum that never happens. They put a P-38 on a, pilot, a pylon in Poplar, and there's a, 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 a room in, his, um, in the local school. And I remember seeing it one time, and I walked in, and there were his medals and his uniform and everything, and there was nobody around, nobody. And I thought, I could break into this case and steal everything and walk out and they wouldn't know. Well, in 1985, uh, they have the big, the big Bong Bridge dedication up there. And the 49th Fighter Group Association is having their annual meeting. So they changed the locale to, to, to go there. And they ask Marge to be there. Since Dick died, she, she pretty much closed the book on that part of her life. She wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't give interviews, whatever. She just got on with life. She became a model. She got married, had a daughter, divorced, uh, got married again, had another daughter, became a manager, uh, uh, created and managed a, a, a magazine called Boxer, uh, Boxer Dogs. But she had very little to do with Dick and his legacy. But come 90, 1985, they invite her and she shows up. And she's so blown away by the reception that uh, uh, she decides, I'm going to help fundraise a museum that's worthy of Dick. So she becomes really the unofficial spokesperson for what became the Bong uh, Visitors or Veterans Center up in Superior. Tirelessly going from place to place, talking about it, getting donations. Eventually, uh, they get enough money to open up the uh, the center in Superior, and uh, and uh, which is worthy of him certainly. I was up there a couple weeks ago g giving a talk, and it's so much better than a, a P-38 on a pylon in Little Poplar. Uh, and then she uh, develops cancer, and she moves back to. Um, Poplar and dies there, and she's buried next to Dick. And so the, it's, it's kind of come full circle now that she and Dick are together up there. His legacy is preserved forever. And, you know, he, in, in so many ways, he was an amazing individual. He was not, you know, cigarette smoke, a cigar smoking, skirt chasing, boisterous, you know, 
so social lion, quiet, shy on the ground. But once he got into a P-38, he became something different. He became a masterful pilot and achieved greatness, I mean military greatness, but yet he never lost the, the human touch. He never bragged about what he did. He never lost the fact that what was important was home and family and things like that. The medals and everything, that was nice, but you know, if you read his letters home, oh, I got the Distinguished Flying Cross today. That was for like 20 kills. Sometimes I can't tell what I got. Oh, how, how are you coming on, on, on the farm? Have you planted the corn yet? How's Uncle Clem doing? Do, uh, do, do, his, do his dentures fit yet? It's kind of like, okay, the balance never left him. And, and Marge at one point said, you know, he came back to us the way he left us. He didn't change. He never lost those basic principles that made him a, a, a wonderful human being. So in a very long nutshell, that's the Dick Bong story. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Uh, what, was his inner, what was his relationship with his fellow pilots? Well, like I said, um, he had, he was friendly. He, he, should I keep that? <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. He was friendly, but he was quiet. He, uh, he, he would talk shop and everything, but he, generally he didn't lower his guard until like at night when he was with his tent mates, and then they talked about serious subjects. He was, he's very, uh, you know, family, home, that kind of thing. He, he wasn't your typical gregarious fighter pilot, but they all respected him. I mean, he was a, they thought he was a marvelous fighter pilot, good fighter leader. Uh, it's just that he was quiet. Well, that's okay because the other 12 guys in the squadron are in your face. Hey, I'm the greatest in the world. Let's go have a beer. Let's chase some women. You know, he, uh, he fit in fairly well. Yes. Uh, Public has a half -hour show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, oh no, not at all. They uh, they they did their own they did their own research, and they didn't uh, actually they didn't ask me. So <laughs> I would have been glad to be on the program. No, no. But I mean that, that's fine. The more information you get out on them, the better. Because I didn't like the fact that. As I, as I researched it, I got this thing that he was the forgotten ace and he didn't deserve that fate. He deserved for somebody to say he was the best of the best. He was the top gun before they invented the phrase top gun. And, you know, he did a lot. Uh, oh, here's one thing. Reporters could get Dick riled up by calling him hero. You know, you're a, a, the Air Force's latest hero. You've done heroic things. Then he would say, I'm not a hero. I'm just doing my job. Time and again, he, he, that, that would come up. So again, per, a balance to what he's doing. I'm doing my job. I get medals, but so what? I want to go home. I want to marry Marge. You know, I want to have a career in aviation. It, it, this is all passing. It's not that important. Yes? Well, um, I'm not sure I can answer that question adequately. Um, he certainly was respected, and I think they, they have different trophies now, like in the Air Force, the Bong Trophy for the best fighter pilot, that kind of thing. Um, he, you know, it, it's kind of funny because if he enlisted in the Air Force now and made it all the way through training, I don't know that they'd put him in fighter pilot in fighter planes because they're looking again for that type A behavior and he wasn't that man until he actually got in the aircraft. You know, he, he, when they talked about leading a squadron, he, he knew himself enough to say, I, I'll, I'll never be able to be a squadron leader because squadron leaders and group commanders have what's called command presence. You know, you, you stand up in front of people and say, we're going to do this, this, and this. I want you to do that. I'm going to be doing this. Dick wasn't that kind of person. You know, he's quiet and shy. He, he knew himself enough to say, that's not, I, I can't be that person as much as you want me to be. But there were other guys in the squadron that were more than willing to step up and say, I'd like my own squadron. I want to be a group commander. I want to be a colonel. Uh, so uh, 
uh, I'm sorry if I didn't quite answer that question. But. How did you become a major? Where, where, where promotions. Major? Promotions. B the more kills he got, the more medals he got, the promotions came along. So was it at a certain stage how many he did? And if, if would all the other guys get that too? Would they be majors too if they got, say, seven? Not, necessar not necessarily. That's a really good question. Um, Remember his status in the Air Force, that he was a celebrity. So when he got um, 30 kills, you know, uh, maybe another pilot would have, got, would have been made major, but it wasn't cut and dry that if you got like 25, you became a captain. If you got 30, you became a major. There were other things wrapped up in it that determined when you got it. Uh, so other questions? Yes. Before his death, yeah, he was he was a major in December '44, something like that. Yeah, but realistically, if he'd stayed in the Air Force, he would never have probably held command because he wasn't um, what they were looking for in a commander. He he, and at some point in time, to remember him saying, you know, I I might stay in the military after the war, but I'd kind of like to fly civilian. You know, I'd like to be like an airline pilot, or maybe even a maybe even a test pilot at Lockheed. I'm not sure, but I don't think a career in the Air Force was looking at him. He was looking at it. Questions, folks? Any? Yeah. Pat. Yeah. What made him so Um, good question. A couple of things that, that, uh, that I've come up with is um, when he when he got to, uh, f flew the P thirty eight. You know, sometimes the, the the man and the machine are a perfect match. The P thirty eight was a perfect match to his combativeness, his mechanical skills, his mechanical abilities, his the, the aggressiveness that was in him, and it helped push him to to. To, to really fly the aircraft to the max. Uh, the people that flew with him said, you know, God, he's good in the air. I, when I'm flying his wing, I have to pay attention all the time because he might be gone just like that. He sees somebody and dives away. And if I'm not paying attention, I'm up here, he's down there. The other thing, uh, the other thing was he was kind of, a na kind of a natural gunner from all of his, his you know, growing up. I mean, those of us that hunted, you know, we developed that shotgun method. He kind of used that in, in the Air Force. Um, but certainly the, the P-38, the, uh, the, uh, his natural gunnery skills, his aggressiveness, uh, and his analytical mind that said, I'm going to get that, I'm going to attack that guy. Okay, I got him, I'm breaking away. Or I didn't get him, I'm going to break away. He wasn't like a guy named... Um, Tom McGuire, who's in one of these pictures. McGuire was his closest rival in the ace race. McGuire was bound and determined to be the ace of aces. He, uh, Dick came from a, a close-knit farm family. He was you know, ninth, he had responsibilities. McGuire came from a broken family. He was the sole son in a divorced family. Growing up, he wasn't that good looking, so he got bullied a lot, and he grew up with a chip on his shoulder. When he got into the Air Force, I think he saw that, and became a fighter pilot, I think he saw that as a chance to, pro to prove to, to everybody, I am somebody, and I'm gonna be somebody by becoming the ace of aces and toppling bong, and I'm going to get a Medal of Honor, and I'm going to be a colonel at war's end. Right, Bong, Bong was analytical, cool-headed. McGuire would jump into a dogfight and shoot down three or four enemy aircraft. He was a brilliant gunner, brilliant pilot, but you know, he, he let his emotions get to him in the end, and on his final combat mission, again, he died because he violated basic flying procedures. And it cost him his life, and so, you know, what did you gain? I mean, they gave him the Medal of Honor posthumously, but Dick, for whatever reason, Dick had the right attitude, which is, I'm gonna do the best I can, but I'm not gonna be stupid about it. I'm going to come home because I want to marry Marge and have kids and stuff. She's going to do the stupid things. Yes. When they did the stunts with the flying under the bridge and all that, 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Was he full in, in on that? Was, I mean, there were four of them, right? Yes, there were. Yes, there were. No, I didn't say that. I can't answer that question because Dick would never talk about it to anybody. Well, he admitted to his family that he had blown the laundry off the clothesline. He admitted that. He didn't. He wouldn't. He wouldn't admit anything else. He would, he would never ask or answer reporters' questions about what had happened. The reports on the incident are are not there. They disappeared. And maybe that was that report that Kenny tore up and threw away. I don't know, but trying to pin down who it was, and I've only been able to pin down like, I think three of the four people. And uh, so I can't say that, yes, he flew around the Golden Gate. All I know is he would only admit to, to buzzing a, a, a friend's home in San Anselmo that unfortunately had a line of wash out that day. Yes, we were talking treetop height. But that's probably why Kenny said, how does the handle, how does the P-38 handle at low altitude? Well, it doesn't get much lower than that. So, yes. Of all the PR tours he did for hmm. Warbond, whatever, when he was home stateside, is yeah. there a lot of um, movie footage? There, there, there's, there's some movie footage um, that, 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 uh, special that somebody alluded to about public TV or public radio. I think they have some there. Uh, some of that is in National Archives. Some of it is, um, I don't forget it somewhere. Uh, I've never seen any, and I would just assume since he was su such a, he was used as a PR tool. And Warbond. To, to a point, yes, so, he yeah, was. Right. But I would assume there'd be some out there. Would there have been any, any gun camera recordings of uh, yes, there's in, in the book, um, I have a couple stills out of his gun camera. Um, oh, I was going to mention you talked about his flying. There, there, there are newspaper photographs that show him buzzing superior, and he's at a, uh, maybe like two-story height flying over. Uh, when he got home, typically the Air Force would give him a P-38 and say, you know, fly wherever you want, do whatever you want, which was a really bad thing to say to Dick Baum. Because he, he buzzed the farm family, he buzzed Poplar, he buzzed Superior. I, did, he, I think he flew under some Superior bridge, as I recall. But there, and there must be some footage, maybe the Bong Center up in Superior, maybe you could check with them to see what they have. But he, he again, he loved, he loved flying low altitude, I know that. Not just to blow off laundry, but he just loved flying at low altitude. He'd take the family up and scare the hell out of them, just at treetop height. But, he was just quite a guy, quite a guy. So anyway, other? Okay, folks, I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.